What has been your experience of love? How many people in your life do you think truly love you? I was thinking of that and wondering, how many people truly love me? Because one of the greatest desires of the human heart is to love and to be loved. God has made us in His image, and God is a God of love. And every one of us wants to love someone or others and also to be loved. And the wonder of the Christian gospel is that whoever you are, whatever your background, whatever your experience of love, and you may have come from the worst home in all of North America, and perhaps you experienced very, very little love there, or perhaps you came from a most loving home where you've always felt loved. But whoever you are, the message of the gospel, the message of Christ to you is that God loves you. The Bible says that in many, many ways, that God so loved the world. Brian, as he's beginning our worship this morning, quoted from Romans chapter 5, a verse that we studied some time ago, uh, that God shows His love for us. And Paul tells us how God shows His love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It wasn't when we're wonderful people. It's not that you deserve God's love. In fact, Paul emphasizes the sinfulness of each one of us, and yet God's love is greater than that, and God shows His love supremely and wonderfully in the cross of Christ, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, as we come uh, to the passage in Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 13 this morning, Paul is focused now not so much on God's love for us. He's done that, particularly in Romans chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8. He's done that. And it isn't even so much our love for God, although we are commanded to love God as we sang with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now the focus is on our love for others. Do you love others? As you come to Calvary Church, do you experience God's love through His people? Are you loving your brothers and sisters here at Calvary Church? Are you a loving person? John, the apostle of love, writes, Beloved, as God so loved us, we ought also to love others. God has loved you, therefore we are to love others. Our Lord Jesus said, as the choir reminded us, By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Are you a loving person? You want to be loved? You want to be cared for? Of course you do. Of course I do. But the challenge this morning is, are you, am I, a loving person? D.L. Moody said, Satan separates, God unites, love binds us together. Our enemy is described as a murderer from the beginning. He is evil. He is hated. He hates. He tries to divide. He tries to divide churches and families and friendships. He's the divider. He's the hater. But Moody got it right that God unites and love binds us together. Perhaps he was thinking of Paul's word in Colossians 3 verse 14, where Paul says, beyond all these, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. The Apostle, Paul, the Apostle John writes, little children, let us not love with word or with tongue. That's easy for someone to say, I love you, but John is reminding us, no, I want you to love in deed and in truth. And so here in Romans 9, Romans 12 rather, verses 9 through 13, Paul turns to this vital subject of genuine love. Earlier in Romans chapter 12, after giving us the challenge of total commitment, he deals with the important subject of us functioning together as a local church. And he reminds us, if we're going to do that, we must be characterized by humility. We need to maintain the unity. We must learn to understand that not everyone is the same as us. We are to appreciate the diversity that God has given us all a gift, but the gifts are different. But they are to be used 
in a humble way for the glory of God and for the good of others. And in doing this, it is essential that not only are we humble, but that we love. In other words, authentic love, genuine love, is to be the pervading atmosphere of the local church. Is that true of us at Calvary? Is that true in your home? Is your home a place of love? Is that true of your relationships? That those who know you the best, who live with you, who work with you, who interact with you, would say, this person is a person of love, genuine love. And Paul, and this is a very convicting passage, Paul is dealing now with love in action. This is not some sentimental, sickly, superficial love, nor is it raw emotion, but this is strong, biblical, authentic love. And if our love for God and our love for the Word of God doesn't result in love for others, there is something radically wrong. And it's long troubled me that some who claim to be the deep students of the Word of God, who claim to stand for the truth, are sometimes very harsh, very judgmental, very unloving, and very unforgiving. Remember, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13 that he could do many things, but without love, it all amounts to zero. He gains nothing. Now, Paul, as he writes under the inspiration of the Spirit now, he's still dealing with the implications of a life totally committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's called for that in the first two verses. And you say, well, what does it look like? If I am committed to the Lord Jesus Christ, what's that going to mean in my life? What's, going to, what's it going to mean in my relationships, in my home, at work, and here in the church? Well, here it is. Here is practical, applied, visible Christianity. You ready for it? Let's end and read Romans 12 now, verses 9 through 13. And let's read it thoughtfully. It's not a long passage, but it's a very convicting one. Here it is. Read with me. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Amen. Please be seated. The basic command, the injunction, the exhortation is be genuine in your love. Verses 9 and 10. If you have a Bible, open it with me there. There's one in the pew. Romans 9 again, Romans 12 then, verse 9 and 10, let love be genuine. We're reading from the English Standard Version. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Our love must be genuine. The New International Verse says our love must be sincere. Genuine love is the theme of verses 9 through 21. In our passage today, the focus is, is on loving our brothers and sisters in Christ. Next week, as we think from verses 14 through 21, the focus is not so much within the Christian community, but we're also to love those who are not part of the Christian community. In fact, we're commanded to love our enemies. Love, then, is to be the greatest characteristic of the Christian. And the more we drink of the love of God, the more we spend time at the cross of Christ meditating and understanding in a deeper and deeper way the love of God for us, the more then we will love others. So here Paul says, verse 9, let love be genuine. It's to be authentic. It's to be sincere. Uh, the Greek word here translated genuine or sincere is not hypocritical. Your love is not to be hypocritical. What's a hypocrite? Well, this word in secular Greek has a reference to the world of the theater. There, 
you have someone deliberately pretending. Someone on the stage, they're acting. It's not who they really are. They're playing a part. They are pretending. They're in a role. And Paul is saying, no, your love is not to be like the hypocrite. Was it Woody Allen who said that if you're going to be a good actor, you really have to learn how to fake sincerity? Well, we're not to fake sincerity. You're not to fake love. It's to be genuine. It's to be authentic. Don't pretend that you love someone. Don't be phony in it, we would say in our vernacular. No, this love is to be genuine. It's to be biblical. It's open-hearted, not putting on a show. And we must understand, and this may be difficult for some of us, we must understand that different personalities and certainly different cultures show their love in different ways. If you've always lived in the South, you show your love a certain way. For those of us who come to this culture, it takes a little bit getting used to, uh, just as if you went to Scotland. Or I spent many, uh, about nine years, nine, ten years in Michigan. There the culture is primarily Dutch, somewhat like the Scottish, not quite as good, but something similar. <laughs> and in Scotland and in the Dutch culture, at least in Michigan, is there are not many people committing the sin of flattery. Uh, <laughs> compliments are not uh, too much. Uh, it takes a while to get to know people. And so, as you travel, as you come into contact with different nationalities, and we're blessed here at Calvary to have people from all over the world, understand that we're not talking about a certain cultural manifestation of this love. The important thing is that it is genuine. The first time I went to Kazakhstan after being there a few days, I had a meeting with some of the pastors there, and at the end of it, this man came and uh, planted a huge big kiss right on my lips. <laughs> and I thought, whoa, <laughs> you know? I mean, in Scotland we wear the kills, but we do not kiss men. <laughs> And uh, I said to the interpreter, I said, I've never had such an experience in my life. It was a big smacker. And he said very seriously, he said, John, this means that you're a brother. I said, of course I'm a brother. I was saved when I was 12. He said, yes, but now they feel you're a pastor, and they really love you, and this is the way they show their love. Next time I just kept a straight arm. Uh, so there it is. No, Paul is not talking about some particular cultural manifestation of the love. That's not the point. He's saying whoever you are, your personality, your culture, it must be sincere. It must be authentic, genuine inner love. Think of the kiss of Judas, the very opposite of genuine, very, very opposite of authentic. It was the kiss of the hypocrite. It was the kiss, the very act of betrayal. No, be genuine in your love. Now, what Paul is saying here, and I think we understand it, that genuine love makes a difference. This is practical Christianity, and genuine love is demonstrated. How would any of us know that we're loved unless there's a demonstration of it? You can say, well, you can communicate and say to someone, I love you. Yes, that is true, and that is appropriate. But I think all of us understand that while it's nice to hear someone say, I love you, it is much, much better, much, much more meaningful when the profession of the lips is followed by a certain attitude, a helpfulness, a tenderness. Now, this authentic love is not sentimental, but notice what Paul says. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Does it surprise you that love and evil are in the same verse? Notice very… we must notice very carefully how different this is from our present culture, where we're told if you love someone, 
you must automatically approve of everything they do. You've heard people say that. Well, they love each other. Uh, what's your hang-up, man? In other words, if you say you love someone, it must be all right. No, not necessarily. That's a failure to recognize that there is conduct which is good, and there is conduct which is evil. Same verse, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Remember, President Bush was criticized after 9-11 for saying that these acts of flying airplanes into our buildings in New York City, he said it was evil, and people were, he was criticized for it. But there are, there's conduct which is good, and there's conduct which is evil. Is God all loving? Absolutely. The very essence of God is love. The Bible says that, that God is love, but God is also holy. He's also righteous. And this love holds fast to that which is good and pursues it. It doesn't compromise its standards. We don't make our definitions, our own definitions, of what is good and evil. Moral rights and moral wrongs are not defined by the individual or even by the culture. Ultimately, they are defined by God. Not your feelings, not the culture, but what God says about particular conduct. And I have to remind you that just because some conduct is lawful doesn't make it right, doesn't make it good. Remember when I was a law student, the British Parliament had the British Somewhat half-hearted, but it's okay, I'll take it. The, when I was a law student, the, the, the British Parliament had passed a law saying that homosexuality uh, was, now, was no longer illegal as it had been. And I remember going to the Law Society of uh, Law Students there at Edinburgh University, and they had invited I'm sorry, I'm having problems with this on my ear. They had invited uh, a very famous judge that probably none of you have heard of called Lord Denning. He was the master of the rules. He was one of the best known uh, judges. And although he was English, he'd been invited to the Scottish University to speak to students. And uh, he gave a very eloquent and on a particular subject for which I forget. But then there came the question time. And in the course of his lecture to us, he had talked about the homosexual issue. And I remember uh, one of my friends standing up, and uh, with supreme confidence, this young law student uh, trying to contradict Lord Denning. And his question was, Lord Denning, homosexuality is no longer illegal. And I think you mentioned the word sin. If it means it's illegal, it means it's not sinful. And Lord Denning, who later I found out, I think, was a believer in Jesus Christ, very graciously, uh, but very carefully, put this young man in his position and said, absolutely not. Because the parliament says this is lawful, doesn't mean that it's morally right. And I think in our society, we've grown up thinking because a law permits something that it means it's all right. Is it permissible for people to live together although they're not married? Yes. The law says that's okay. Is it lawful to commit adultery according to our law in many jurisdictions? Yes. If you commit adultery, you're not going to be imprisoned for it. But does that make it right? No. Paul is saying here, very, very importantly, abhor what is evil and hold fast to what is good. That is, as followers of Jesus Christ, I'm to learn to love what God loves, and I'm to learn to hate what God hates. You say, hate? Very interestingly, the NIV at the end of verse 9, translates it, hate what is evil. Abhor, that is, turn from it, have nothing to do with it. That means authentic love 
hates evil practices in others. Does that surprise you? It shouldn't. John says in the prologue of his gospel that the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Jesus was the most gracious of men, and he was also absolute truth. Psalm 85 says, mercy and truth meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Uh, these are not opposites. You can't say just because someone is loving that whatever they do is automatically good. No, genuine love, authentic love, biblical love does not overlook evil conduct. So let me say this again another way very clearly. Genuine love never leads you to do something which is evil. Genuine love, the love of God and the heart of the believer, will never ever lead you to do that which is evil. So the young man who says to his, his girlfriend, if you love me, you'll allow me to sleep with you, and she says no, and he then says, well, that means you don't love me. Absolutely not. True love, do you hear me? True love pursues that which is good and abhors that which is evil. Notice what Paul says here, hold fast to what is good. We need to hear this in our society, don't we? They talk so much about love. We are to hold fast to what is good. You want to know what is good and what is evil? This is why we turn over and over again to the Word of God. Now notice verse 10. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. You see, this love is a tender one. Paul uses the word from which we get Philadelphia, a brotherly love. The kind of love that you have in your family between children, between mom and dad and the children and the extended family. This is a warm, intimate, tender affection that we have for one another. After all, the church is the family of God, and there should be a sense of warmth, a sense of intimacy, a sense of great freedom as we come together, Paul says, loving one another with brotherly affection. This is not some cold duty. This is not doing something that we don't want to. This is the very heartbeat of God who loves us and transforms us. And so perhaps by personality we are cold, and perhaps we come from a home where there was very, very little love, but now under the grace of God, and under the work of the Spirit of God, we're being transformed, and it transforms our relationships, where someone comes from a home where they didn't know much love, and now they are warmly affectionate to others. Isn't that a beautiful thing when you see it? Aren't you so thankful for brothers and sisters at Calvary here who, reaches, who reach out to you with this brotherly affection. And then Paul says, outdo one another in showing honor. This genuine love is demonstrated in outdoing others in honoring them. Don't wait for people to honor you. No, you are to honor them. Don't always push for first place. Don't always be in the front of the line particularly in going through the buffet. Think of others. Put others first. This is basic, practical Christianity. Stop putting yourselves, can I be blunt? Stop putting yourself at the center of every conversation and every situation. Everything isn't about you. We think of our Lord lowly and humble of heart. Question is asked in Jeremiah, do you seek great things for yourself? Answer, seek them not. It's not all about you. 
Think of that brother and that sister, perhaps who's more reserved than you, perhaps who's shyer than you. Outdo them in honor. Put them first. The story is told of the author who had a huge, huge ego, and he's in a home a dinner party, and they're talking, and he's talking, and he's talking, and he's talking all about himself, his accomplishments, the books he had written, everything that he had done. And perhaps even this insensitive man began to discern that the people around the table were getting a little bored by him. Indeed, they had after five minutes, but he had gone on for a couple of hours. And then finally he says, well, that's enough about me. What do you think of my book? <laughs> Easy to become like that, isn't it? What do we read here? Outdo one another in showing honor. Don't be resentful of the successes of others. That's not loving. Honor them and thank them. Be genuine in your love. Now, verses 11 through 13, Paul says, this genuine love is certainly demonstrated. Verse 11, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, and seek to show hospitality. So, first of all, verse 11, this genuine love is demonstrated in caring for and serving others. It's diligent. It's zealous. It's not lazy in serving others. It's fervent. It's not lukewarm. It's boiling. It's a, a glow. Be set on fire by the Spirit is one translation. See, this genuine love doesn't lead to mediocrity. When we serve the Lord, when we love God, and we love others. We serve others with passion, genuine, caring for them. We just commissioned this team going to Mexico, and they're going to be caring and serving children who are very much deprived. How are they to serve them? Just because we send them in a cold, mechanical duty? Absolutely not. We, they are to do this with zeal, fervent in spirit, glowing with the Spirit, with a heart full of love for these children, serving them, lovingly sharing with those in need. Did you ever do that? When was the last time you lovingly shared with someone in need? And this is going to be demonstrated consistently in our lifestyle. Look at verse 12, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. We must have joy in our hope. Refers us back, doesn't it, to chapter 5, Romans 5, verse 2. Paul says at the end of verse 2, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings. Isn't that incredible? We rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Here we are, and we're suffering. We're going through some affliction, some pressure, some, some trial. The word is used in the New Testament in many ways for persecution and hardships and sickness and anxiety and fears. What are we to do? We're to be steadfast. We are to be patient in tribulation. We are to rejoice in hope. This is not easy, is it? But these situations that we find, that all of us find ourselves in from time to time, are an opportunity, aren't they, to afresh put our trust in this God of love. And to know that I am loved that God has not abandoned me, that I'm loved with an everlasting love. And says Paul, be constant in prayer, not half-hearted, consistent and faithful. Isn't this a way that we demonstrate our love for one another? 
that we pray for them. Pastor Cashwell encouraged us to pray for this huge team going to Mexico. And we're sitting there, and we're getting, as it were, a picture of them in our minds, and we're being exhorted to keep praying for them. But it's very easy on Monday morning or Tuesday night to almost totally have forgotten about go Mexico, go Monterey. No, we are to be constant. I want to thank those of you who pray for the watchman prayer. We began that several years ago, and there was a, a tremendous, a, a moving outpouring of people who said, yes, with the Lord's strength, I'm going to pray for the ministries of Calvary Church on this particular hour every week, and they, you selected an hour. And so every month, my fellow pastors and directors at Calvary, we send out our prayer requests. And as I'm writing them every month, I, I, I sometimes think now, I wonder how many who signed up for that are constant in prayer, constant in prayer. We finished our week of missions, and we said to our missionaries, we're going to pray for you. And I got the other day, the, just two or three days ago, the list of the requests for this month. Are we going to be faithful? You have someone in your life group, and they're, they're struggling. They're going through a, a real difficulty with their family, or their marriage, or their children, or their health, or ministry, and you genuinely love them, and you, you say to them, I, I'm going to be praying for you. But are we constant in our prayer? Perhaps have a prayer journal. Perhaps write it down. Perhaps send them a note to say, I'm praying for you. That is a way, isn't it, that we demonstrate that we're genuine in our love for one another. And then Paul says here in verse 13, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Practical Christianity demonstrating in a practical way our love for one another, sharing with the poor, the distressed, the lonely, the hurting. And you say, well, do we have such people at Calvary Church? <laughs> yes, we do. Yes, we do. Many of them. Many of them. And I'm thankful <clears throat> for the various ministries that we have at Calvary. I trust they're more than a ministry, but I think they're an evidence of the genuine love that we have to contribute to the needs of the saint. I think of hearts and hammers, and for the men and the women who go to home, perhaps of a widow, single mother, and in a practical way, with a heart of genuine love and a, a hammer as a practical way of helping this dear sister in Christ or the car ministry. Thank you for those of you who spend hours repairing cars of those who are poor. Our food ministry, the street ministry, genuine love for people, our ministry of benevolence, and so on. What are we doing? We are seeking as a manifestation of this genuine love to contribute to the needs of the saints. And if you feel neglected, my brother, my sister, I'm sorry, let us know. And then says Paul, seek to show hospitality. What's hospitality here? It's loving strangers, going out of our way to help a person. The saints. Let me ask you, when's the last time you invited one of the saints into your home? Someone you didn't know very well, perhaps someone who's new to Calvary, perhaps someone who's come from the other side of the globe, and they come here to Calvary Church, and they know hardly anyone, or someone who moves from the north comes down here. A man is very, very busy at his work, and the, the wife is at home with three or four children. How, how many of us reach out to someone like that? Have you ever done that? 
You ever invited someone into your, into your home? I'm very thankful that Goodney and I were both come from homes where our parents invited people to our homes. As you know, I come from a large family. And if I, my mother perhaps some Sunday was at home with, a, with one of my younger brothers, and my dad would meet someone at the local assembly, and invariably he asked them back for lunch. As a boy growing up, I never thought about it. I never thought what that meant for my mother. Contributing to the needs of the saints. I remember good and I hadn't been long married. We were living in, in uh, Scotland, and this Wednesday night Bible study and prayer time we were at, and uh, there were two young men hitchhiking through Scotland. They were from Belgium, I think, or, or, or the Netherlands. And we spoke to them afterwards, and it found out that they had nowhere to stay. And I very quickly said, well, come and stay with us. And so they came to our house. And I remember a good day giving them uh, some supper. And as they were speaking, I suddenly thought, these are odd kind of guys. And they, they then asked me if I had a gun. And uh, I had a shotgun, in fact. Uh, we, we were living out from the city in the country, and uh, we had quite a number of rabbits who had come onto my property, and I was, had a little garden, and uh, they liked to eat my garden. And so, I'm sorry uh, for those of you who love rabbits. I'm really, I love people, and I love rabbits. As a boy, I had two rabbits. One was called Sweep and one was called Bobtail, so I loved rabbits, but not when they're eating my vegetables. And so, as they came on the lawn, I'd get my shotgun, and um, Goodbye to the little rabbit. So, I'm sorry, I apologize. Um, and they asked, and this terrible feeling came. I thought, they're going to murder us in our beds. <laughs> in fact, the room where they were staying had the shotgun. Uh, and so, <laughs> I indicated to Goodney to keep them talking, went into the room, took the shotgun into our bedroom, you know? and. Uh, in case you didn't know, we did survive. <laughs> can it be risky? Yes, it can be risky. Remember, remember the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 13 that some have entertained angels unaware. If you've never had someone into your home, can I ask you to begin to do that? Practice hospitality. As the followers of Jesus, we are to care for the poor, the oppressed, the immigrant, for those different from us, this love is genuine. The world can be a very, very cold and lonely place, and I often think how wonderful it is, perhaps today, even with the hour difference, someone has made their way into Calvary Church, and they're sitting here, or sitting up in a balcony. And God, in His sovereign purposes, has brought them here whether, and perhaps they are really discouraged. How wonderful to know that as they come, not because it's a program, but because like people like you who have experienced God's love in your heart, that you're going to reach out to that person, to that young man, to that woman with the love of Christ. What a difference. Paul is saying this genuine love is to be demonstrated not just in our attitude, not just in our words, but in this consistent care. And so today, before you leave, before you leave this campus, will each one of you reach out to someone you don't know? Now, you're going to find out they'll be here 30 years, then they're going to say, who are you? Take that risk. Reach out to someone you don't know. Introduce yourself. Smile. Get to know them. Show genuine love. Love is the bond of the Christian community. We are to love. Jesus said, by this all, shall all men know you are my disciples, because you have love one to another. Yes, I believe in this book. I believe in the truth of this book, but I also believe that God is a God of love, and when He saves us, He pours His love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us, so that above all other things, we are people of love.
as we will see, loving others who are unbelievers, but also loving within the congregation. Now, can I say to those of you who are quite new, some of you are sitting and saying, well, I'm, I'm waiting for someone to love me. Welcome to the human race. We're all sitting waiting for people to love us. It's a universal need that we have. But don't isolate yourself. Don't just come, sit in the balcony, and then quickly leave. We have life groups. Yes, they will study the Word of God, but an opportunity for people who do love you to give them, to put yourself in an environment where people can reach out to you. Come to the newcomer's reception in the cafe. There will be some there who want to love you and to get to know you so that each one of us, wherever we are and whatever we're doing, are demonstrating this great love to others. We love, John says, because what? He first loved us. Have you received this love? John says, in this, God's love is shown to us. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and gave His Son to be the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And there are some of you here who never have experienced this divine love. To a greater or lesser extent, you know something of human love, but I want you to experience in the very depth of your being the love of God as you look to the cross of Christ, we have it on our ceiling, that there Jesus Christ died for you so that your sins could be forgiven. What a tremendous act of love. Your sins not only forgiven, but that you personally can receive this divine love, this supernatural love, this love that transforms us, this love that changes all of life, that you will receive this life and be an authentic follower of Christ. If you've never committed your life to Jesus Christ, I say to you, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And for those of us who love Christ, may we show our love for Christ in loving others. Today, tomorrow, love someone. Some of you who have children and your children may not even have heard from your lips, I love you. But not only tell them you love them, show by your actions, by your kindness, by your tenderness, that God is a God of love. So that a world that talks about love, but knows so little about love, will know that we are followers of Jesus by our love. Our Father and our God, we thank you that you are a God of love, of infinite love. It blows our minds. We can't take it in. You're the creator of the universe, and yet you know us by name. And you sent your Son to pay the price for our sins. May all of us open our hearts and trust the Lord Jesus Christ and receive your love and your forgiveness, and that we will go and make a tremendous difference because this love is genuine and this love is demonstrated. Help us, Father, and help us at Calvary Church to be known not just as a big building or a wonderful campus, but so that people would say, there are people of love. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.